Are we about to be carried away by the power of airborne wind energy? This is a technology that promises to open up access to better wind resources than traditional wind can at a lower cost with lower environmental impact. The technology has been around for decades now, but why hasn't it quite taken off yet? I'm Rosie Barnes. Welcome to Engineering with Rosie. Airborne wind energy involves a kite or tethered glider or possibly a blimp that catches wind energy high above the ground where wind speeds are much faster and therefore more power is available. In addition to being able to access a better wind resource, materials requirements can be much lower than standard wind turbines because there's no need for a tower or a foundation. And the faster wind speeds mean a smaller device can deliver the same power. So less materials and more power. That must mean cheaper energy, right? So why are we still bothering with normal wind turbines then? Well, airborne wind is quite a lot more complicated than ground-based turbines, and none have come close to reaching the promised potential yet. In this video, I'm going to talk about the different kinds of airborne wind technology, and then look into a few of the challenges that remain to be solved before airborne wind can go from the possibility of cheaper energy to reality. Let's start with why we would bother with the complexity of airborne wind when it's so much easier to simply install a conventional turbine on a tower. Probably the main reason is that kites or gliders can reach a better wind resource. Winds hundreds of meters above the ground are faster and more consistent than those at ground level due to a phenomenon called wind shear. Close to the ground, the wind is slowed down by friction with the ground, buildings, trees, and hills. When you get away from those obstacles, there's nothing to slow the wind. This is important because the power in wind is proportional to the velocity cubed. So if you double the wind speed, then you're going to get eight times as much power. And it's not just wind shear that allows airborne wind to access faster wind speeds. If you fly the kite in a crosswind pattern, then you can increase the speed even further and so get even more power. The other big potential benefit of airborne wind is that without a tower or foundation, it can use a lot less materials. And the components can be small, so they're more easily transportable. A lot of airborne wind companies can just pack everything into a shipping container. And when you don't need to install a foundation, the system can be put up really quickly. The companies currently pursuing airborne wind are using a huge variety of approaches. It's not at all like traditional wind, which nearly all look the same. There are so many weird and wonderful concepts under investigation, and I talked about many of them in a live stream I did a while back. But for today's video, I want to focus on the technologies that are closest to commercialization. And they fall into two sets of two options, ground gen versus fly gen and flexible versus rigid wing. Flygen is precisely what its name implies, a generator that is flying with the power cable running from the generator to the ground. This is basically a regular wind turbine attached to an autonomous glider. Flygen systems can turn their rotors 90 degrees and use them for vertical takeoff and landing, VTOL, like a drone can. Examples of companies doing it in this way are the now defunct Makani, Kitecraft, Windlift, plus one other obsolete one, Altair, who used a blimp to get their generator up. Ground gen, on the other hand, locates the generator on the ground, and the kite or glider is attached to a tether which wraps around the generator like the way a kite string is wrapped around a spool. As the kite climbs, it turns the generator. Eventually, it reaches the end of its tether, literally, and then you have to power the whole thing to reel the kite in again. As a result of this process, the power output is irregular and cyclical. You generate a lot of power as you're unwinding your spool, and then when you need to pull it back in, it consumes some power. So if you want to supply constant power to the grid, then you need to have something like a battery to smooth the peaks and troughs, and or have several systems that are carefully choreographed to compensate power consumption with power production. There are a lot of pros to ground gen, and it's the most common choice for current AWE companies. It's nice to have everything complicated and expensive on the ground, so you don't destroy as much expensive equipment in a crash, and maintenance is also easier if it's on the ground. You also have less weight to pull up and down. Companies developing ground gen systems include Sky Sales, Kite Power, and Kite Energy, to name just a few. The next issue is whether to go with a soft wing or hard wing. Soft wings are really similar to the ones used by kite surfers. They're extremely lightweight because their structural integrity comes from being inflated with air. And because they're flexible, they're less likely to break in a collision. But there are considerable drawbacks to having a non-rigid airfoil. They can't fly as fast and the shape of the aerodynamic profile isn't fixed, so performance is compromised. Also, maintenance is an issue. I mean, I know from the systems that I've worked on in regular wind turbines, anytime you put something flexible in a fatigue environment where there's lots of cyclical loads. It just wears out so fast. I've seen estimates as soft wing kites will need to be replaced every six months or so. Rigid wings, in contrast, can fly fast and are aerodynamically efficient. Quite a few companies originally working on soft wing designs moved on to rigid designs. These include Windlift, Enakai, and Makani and Ampix, though half of those companies have since gone bust. Perhaps because development costs for rigid wings are likely to be higher than soft wings if there are a lot of crashes, because the rigid structures tend to catastrophically break on impact. And what about birds? I have to mention this because I know people will ask. Airborne wind proponents say that they will be kinder to birds. 
just like every other alternative wind technology says. In fact, that was red flag number 11 in my Back to the Future of Wind Energy video with Paul Guype. Airborne wind systems have some plausible sounding reasons for assuming this, especially for soft wind kites, because they're made of soft fabric, they're fairly small, and the tethers don't move as fast as wind turbine blades do, so they might be easier to avoid. There isn't much published work on this topic yet, though. I've seen two papers. First, an industry-sponsored study, which estimated a similar number of bird fatalities as conventional wind turbines. And second, a paper that documents just a few days of field work at a test site in Norway. They didn't see much impacts on birds, but then the kite testing was occurring during the day while the local bird populations were most active at night, so not too much can be learned from that. Large-scale bird studies haven't been done yet because there aren't any AWEs operating outside of test conditions yet, so we don't know the impact on birds for sure. Today's video is sponsored by Brilliant. If you're interested in learning more about the science behind airborne wind, then Brilliant.org is the perfect resource to help you do just that. Brilliant.org brings STEM concepts like math, science, and computer science to life through a visual and interactive approach, which helps the concepts stick because you learn by doing, not just by memorizing. Whether you're a student, educator, or technology enthusiast, Brilliant offers thousands of topics Topics to explore with new content added every month. If you're keen to learn more about the physics of flight, then I suggest you start with Brilliant's lesson on aeroplanes from the Physics of the Everyday course to dive deeper into the principles of lift, aerofoil shape, and flight mechanics, the same concepts that make flying kites and gliders in airborne wind energy possible. So head over to brilliant.org slash engineeringwithrosie to get started for free, or you can also click on the link in the description below. The first 200 viewers to use that link will receive 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. To me, airborne wind energy feels very futuristic, but the concept has actually been around for over 100 years. In the 19th century, a German engineer called Hermann Horace developed concepts of wind power plants with multiple rotors several hundreds of meters high. Then in the 1970s, an Australian team from the University of Sydney developed and tested quad rotor calf for harvesting high altitude wind energy. In the 1980s, Miles Lloyd, an American engineer, formulated an analysis of airborne wind energy in crosswind versus non-crosswind flight. From the early 2000s, there was a bit of a boom in airborne wind, with about 50 institutions working on it by 2013. Most of these have dropped out by now, but there are still at least a dozen companies in the race to commercialize airborne wind energy. Long-term viewers of Engineering with Rosie might be a bit confused why I am kind of keen on airborne wind. I can imagine what you're thinking. But Rosie, aren't you always ridiculing new energy technologies that aren't really new? Didn't you in fact make a whole video on unusual wind energy technologies hyped as the next big thing and told us that they've all been tried and failed to go anywhere? Surely airborne wind fits firmly in this category? Yeah, that is true that I am always wary of technologies that claim to be new and exciting but have actually been around for ages. However, I also said in that video, when you come across one of those technologies, then you need to ask if anything has changed since its first iteration that might make it viable now. In the case of airborne wind, there are a couple of key advances that have happened recently that change everything. If you think about it, airborne wind systems have a lot in common with drones, and drones have gone from incredibly expensive specialized tools to being just about everywhere today. Annoyingly so, actually. <laughs> That's largely due to advances in their control systems. Drones now come equipped with light yet powerful processors and sensors that can be used to navigate in intricate environments. The same advances in electronics have enabled airborne wind systems to fly autonomously. They can track weather patterns, plan optimal routes for harvesting energy, and to some extent they can adjust flight plans in real time to respond to changing conditions. Another relevant advance has occurred in materials. Lightweight yet strong composites are now available, which make airborne wind systems much lighter and easier to handle than in the past. Recent progress in airborne wind technology has been pretty exciting. In the last decade, several companies have built prototypes that demonstrated autonomous operation in all operations operational phases. The largest was a 600 kilowatt fly gen glider by Makani, which was autonomously flown back in 2016. That was an alphabet backed project that was unfortunately discontinued in 2020. I say unfortunately, since it was a cool technology and probably more advanced than its competitors. The technology worked, it was just the economics that didn't work out just the economics. It's not exactly a minor point if you come to realize that the product you're developing will never be cheaper than the competition. Anyway, another rigid wing design Ampix was touted as an industry leader until recently. They were testing a 150 kilowatt prototype until they went bankrupt last year. Of the companies still operating, Sky Sails and Kite Power are probably the furthest advanced. Both of these are ground gen with flexible kites. Sky Sails started off in 2001 using kites to pull ships. They demonstrated a one megawatt autonomous flight over multiple days back in 
2008, but now they're focusing on electricity generation. In 2016, they demonstrated autonomous operation in all phases of a 50 kilowatt system, and they have made the first and only commercial sale in 2021. That was a 150 kilowatt system, and they are also apparently taking orders for a 200 kilowatt system. Then there is kite power. In 2021, they tested a 100 kilowatt system in Aruba and were able to fly for 23 hours continuously before the wind dropped and they had to land. They are currently offering a 100 kilowatt product for pre-order. So those 100 and 200 kilowatt units have still not quite reached commercial maturity, but they're close. For comparison, conventional onshore wind turbines are 25 to 50 times bigger than that at five-ish megawatts and offshore are around 15 megawatts today, soon to be 20 megawatts. There are plans to increase airborne wing areas to reach 500 kilowatts in the next few years, but you'll still need 10 to 30 of those to match a single conventional wind turbine. Other than sky sails and kite power, other companies are following with 50 to 150 kilowatt systems that should be ready by 2025. According to a white paper for Airborne Wind Europe, the cumulative global market reach could reach over 90 megawatts by the end of 2026. And they have optimistically projected out to over 150 gigawatts of airborne wind by 2050. For that to happen though, from 2025, AWE installations would need to follow the same trend that conventional wind turbines followed from 1985. That gives them three years to get to the same technology and commercial readiness level that conventional wind was at in 1985. And from where I sit, they're not that close. There are a number of as yet unsolved challenges that will need to be sorted if they're going to have even a remote chance of it working out that way. Whilst we've seen plenty of companies demonstrate autonomous operation in all phases, these demonstrations have generally been in favorable conditions. No one has yet proven they can fly for extended periods in all kinds of weather conditions. And in fact, right before Alphabet decided to finish up with Makani, the second test flight of their 600 kilowatt glider ended with a crash into the sea. It's clearly not enough to do something once. It needs to happen repeatedly without incident. Autonomous launch and landing is still challenging for everyone, and even more so for ground gen systems that don't have rotors they can power for VTOL. Ground gen devices can launch autonomously with a mast, but it's hard to see how that will work in the absence of wind. And I haven't seen convincing evidence that this problem has been solved, even by the companies that are taking commercial orders already. There will be times when there is low wind at ground level, but good wind resources up high. I mean, that's a large part of the point, remember? And it will be a problem if systems have to wait for wind at ground level before they can launch. The other big challenge is being able to withstand non-ideal operating conditions, especially gusts. A sudden gust would quickly accelerate the kite and increase lift by a lot. This would pull on the tether and in this way design loads can be quickly exceeded. To avoid this, the designer has two choices. Build in a large safety factor so everything is way stronger and way heavier than it needs to be for normal conditions, or risk fracture of the tether or other components which could cause a crash and possibly cause injury to people. And it's not enough to solve each of these problems in isolation. Everything needs to be done in sequence automatically. Launch autonomously, even in non-ideal conditions. Transition to crosswind flight autonomously. Respond to gusts autonomously. Recognize when to land and then do it autonomously. This sequence needs to be robust in all kinds of weather situations and all kinds of fault states. A conventional wind turbine on the ground can be instantly stopped when there's a problem, nearly always without any safety implications. If an airborne system experiences a fault mid-air with, say, their control system, it can't be instantly stopped. It has to be able to safely land even in that fault state. Other Otherwise, these devices aren't going to be allowed anywhere near people. Which leads me to the next challenge. Where are AWE systems going to be allowed? The full regulatory environment is not yet finalized, which causes delays for tests and pilot projects, and it's a roadblock for more commercial sales. In the long run, more favorable regulations will be allowed if airborne wind energy is safe, with a history of many hours of operation without incident. They are in very early days of figuring all this out, but some progress is being made already. There are test sites operating in a few countries by now, and in Europe it's regulated at EU level and classified as a drone since early 2022. But permitting will surely involve additional rules over and above these. So, is airborne the next big thing in wind energy or not? I definitely won't rule it out. Airborne wind has a lot of characteristics of a classic disruptive technology. It has the potential to open up new sources of renewable, sustainable, and reliable electricity generation in areas where conventional wind turbines are not feasible. Because it can be deployed much faster than conventional wind, it could be used for temporary power needs, like for disaster relief, or in areas with limited access to transport conventional wind turbine blades and towers. Another possibility would be in areas prone to hurricanes, as the system could be packed up in extreme conditions. 
these applications that conventional wind can't serve could potentially be a market willing to pay the currently higher cost. And that could provide the opportunity for the industry to produce enough systems to make progress along the technology cost curve. The industry all seems sure that within a decade or so, AWE will be cheaper than established wind technology. I'm not as sure, and the exit of Makani from the race could be seen as evidence that it won't play out that way. And even if the possibility for cheaper energy really is there, there's no guarantee that they can ever achieve it. Reducing cost comes from selling large volumes of systems, and if no one wants to buy the early expensive units, then there will never be any later cheap units. That's why a disruptive technology needs an early niche market that the incumbent can't serve. And Airborne has potentially got that. So it is complex, yes, but we shouldn't rule it out just because it's complicated. I mean, jet engines are super complex and that technology has done just fine. It's likely that engineering issues can be solved eventually if the money doesn't run out first. It will definitely be interesting to see how it turns out. Do you have questions about airborne wind that I didn't answer in this video? Or think my opinion about the technology's potential is way off? I'll be doing a live stream in about a week with airborne wind expert Dr. Roland Schmel, so either write your questions in the comments here or tune in for that live stream. I'll put the link in the description. Huge thanks to the Engineering with Rosie Patreon community whose support helps me and the team dedicate enough time to research these videos thoroughly, and their feedback is so valuable to me to help steer the channel in an interesting direction. If you'd like to join us and chat with like-minded energy nerds like me on the Patreon-only Engineering with Rosie Discord server, then we would love to welcome you to the team. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.